as you can see, we have three very knowledgeable experts in their fields. Three very important business sectors for the state of Kentucky. Bourbon, horses, and coal. And so we're going to have some discussion from them, and I hope you'll be thinking about some good questions for them. But before we start, before we get into their comments, I'd like to just tell you four um, very important um, facts, I'd like to say. Kentucky's GDP in 2011 was almost $165 billion. Exports hit a record 20 billion. That's 12% of our GDP. Exports are responsible for creating some 49,000 jobs and indirectly for another 38,000 jobs for Kentucky. And Kentucky is the 20th largest exporting state in the United States. Very important <clears throat> facts. So without hesitation now, let's start. And Bill, we'll start with you so on that end. And we'll ask Bill Samuels to make some statements and some. Uh, do I get to come to the chair? I'm, I'm, is that if, yours or if, do we get to share it? Because I'm going in for surgery here pretty soon. Can't hardly walk. Well, whatever you'd like no, to I, do. Well, you let can me come sit up there. Right go. where you are, or you may I'll come here. I'll just stay here. But I want everybody to understand that I am retired, I'm half blind, <laughs> I'm old, and I've been drooling for the last couple of weeks. And, and I knew Nick was going to be up here, so I figured I need to know what I was talking about, so I did a little research, and as soon as I did it, I put it down on a sheet of paper, and then I'd forget it. That's the other problem with being old. But uh, what I'd like to do is to do this in a little different way. I'd like to start from the big end of the funnel, work it down, and just do it with little facts as we come in and then draw a couple of, of conclusions which seem really obvious to me and the challenge is maybe they're not so obvious maybe I'm just brainwashed uh, so what uh, I'd like to start by saying there's nobody Pierce left so he'd be the only other one it's old uh, what bourbon was like 50 years ago. It was, we had 35 years in decline. It was a commodity of the worst kind. When I got out of school and went on the road, I had people tell me, ooh, now that stuff they make up in Kentucky is all right, but let me show you some good stuff. Now I'm talking about South Carolina, North Carolina, West Virginia, talking about moonshine. <laughs> and we don't have any of those issues today. <laughs> Bourbon has climbed the the image ladder probably better than any other product in the country. Now granted it started lower than almost any, <laughs> but it is, it has the respect of every whiskey drinker in the world. And it has sharing at an ever increasing pace top shelf recognition in all the fine watering holes around the world. Now that's the first observation and that's and, and I really did get to see a lot of that, and I just, uh, as many of y'all know, uh, my mother and father had a little bit to do with that. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I looked into, and it was really amazed, that of all the adult beverages talked about on Facebook, bourbon is more than two to one the most talked about of the categories. It is also 1.5 times uh, Google searched of any other spirits category. Now that's right now, that's not 20 years ago. Good sign. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that bourbon is experiencing tremendous growth and it is actually accelerating. The growth is accelerating internationally and domestically. Uh, we did some research, and I think some of the other companies did also, and I've called, this has been great because I, I had a reason to call everybody and find out what they're doing. I'm a nosy bastard, see, just like Pierce said. <laughs> but I want to find out what the competition's doing, and they all shared the work they had done. When we make an investment, we're making it for six and seven years out, so we had to have some idea that what we were dealing with was not a fad. 
and the, uh, the collection and the collation of this wonderful uh, insights uh, indicates that the demographics are right, the psychographics are right. Everything indicates that this is a very long-term sustainable trend that we're going through in the bourbon industry. Now, well, what about Kentucky? In, when I started in 1967, only 52% of the, of the world's bourbon was made in Kentucky. Today, almost 96%. And all of those distilleries around Pennsylvania and Maryland and Indiana and Missouri and all of them that used to make bourbon aren't doing it because the dogs won't eat the dog food <laughs> from those places. 95% of the world's bourbon. Now think about this. All of y'all are business people. We're talking about a high margin monopoly. 95% of the world's bourbon, and possibly even more important, 100% of the brands that are driving the internationalization of bourbon come from Kentucky. Okay? So you got 95% of the liquid, 100% of the brains, images, brands. Uh, barrel production, which is another indicator of how much confidence these people have, all of us have, in what we're doing. This year, uh, uh, we will produce 1.3 million barrels of bourbon. Uh, that's a triple from 1999. It's expected to reach 2 million in 2016, and if the, if the uh, plant and equipment were there, it would probably uh, be earlier than 2016, according to, uh, to my friends. All of this is, of course, good for Kentucky. And uh, I said I would give Jerry Summers a shout out. This is where he gets his shout out because he's the exception. He's the one that goes crawling to government looking for stuff. But the fact is that this is an industry that can sustain its growth without government subsidies. Interest either state, local, or federal. It's a, during this last five years of the, of the recession, we we're the only uh, 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 manufacturing in, within the manufacturing sector that actually grew jobs. Uh, at Makers, in those five years, uh, we more than doubled. And one of the little factors that, that has increasing the jobs in our industry, as the bourbon distilleries stabilized and as, as the owners of these distilleries' confidence in bourbon increased, they started moving their bottling of non-bourbon products to Kentucky. And in the last five years, it's gone from about 22% to about 38% of the stuff you see on a retail liquor shelf that, that is bottled in the United States is actually bottled in Kentucky. That could go to above 60% if the trends continue. And that's where the manufacturing jobs are in our industry. It's bottling, an awful lot of it's bottling, <coughs> and that which services the bottling. Uh, on the tax part uh, and, and on the capital and equipment part, the confidence is such, everybody told me how much their investments were this last year. $218 million, plant and equipment, Kentucky distilleries. And I think it's just getting started. We've got $1.7 billion in assessed value of our barrel inventory, and it's up 25% from last year. A lot of the taxes come from that number. Okay, that's the value of the barrel inventory. 40% of all the distilled spirits shipped out of the country are bourbon. It's growing faster than any other piece of that component at plus 20 percent. It's expected to reach, uh, to reach one billion in uh, four years. We're happy with that one. Uh, now there's a dilemma. Okay, the dilemma is that the bourbons that are selling are all top end. And, they, and they're all in the barrel six to seven years. So, Guess what? Everything that's going to be for sale for the next six or seven years has already been made. Demand is growing like this. Supply, by all indications, is not sufficient to keep up with what we're looking at. 
ergo, all the bourbon available over the next six or seven years will sell. That's, you're the first to know. Go load up. <laughs> because guess what else is going to happen? The prices are going to go up. And that's good for Kentucky. Uh, the other thing I learned from Governor Collins back when she used to haul me around in her little airplane before it crashed and all, but you weren't in it when it crashed, thank goodness, was the, the importance of high value, value added. And, and this little in industry, when I tell you that what's selling internationally is very expensive compared to very expensive scotches, uh, and it's growing like a weed, a farmer, a Kentucky farmer, takes a bushel of corn to market and he gets seven dollars and a half. He takes that same bushel of corn to market in bottles of bourbon and he gets, and the, the value added is about five hundred dollars for that one bushel. And that's not just makers, that's the, uh, that's a, uh, an indication of what's, uh, what's going on. Now, when I, when I get through, when I, I did all my, I said, oh, my God, it can't be this good. There's got to be something wrong. But I'm telling you, Kentucky distilleries do not have a problem, or at least one that anybody's willing to admit or, or sees. However, from an unusual source, I believe in some of these friends of mine at the other companies believe that the state of Kentucky may have a problem. And the problem is, will Kentucky be savvy enough and smart enough and sophisticated enough to leverage what has happened? And by that I mean, wouldn't it be great if in 20 years this little industry, which is growing like a house of fire, is five or six times as valuable as it is now? And Kentucky still has 95% of all the liquid sold around the world. And 100% of the brands that are driving that growth. And so I figured, where would I go to get some insights into that? And it was from the startups, the micro distillers. Where else? What does capital, what does successful capitalism breed? It breeds others coming into the category. And in the last three years, there have been 400 micro distillery startups in the country. Only 5% have chosen to locate in Kentucky. This is not good, guys. And I talk to maybe three or four of them a week. And when I understood I was going to be here, I started asking them, why are you doing there? Well, one of the factors is state pride. They, they're they're going to do some business in their own state. But the fact is, they're going to hit the ceiling there, and they know it. And that's going to be it, because bourbon is Kentucky. But they've chosen to go out of Kentucky, and the two reasons that I got handed back to me, one was this, this, this ad valorem tax issue that we have. Don't want to blame Happy Chandler for everything, but he did influence Franklin Circuit Court to, to decree that bourbon was a finished product the minute it came off the still, even though we can't call it bourbon and nobody would buy it, that's when we have to start paying the finished goods tax. This is the only product in any state in the country that pays that tax more than once. And, and at Makers, we pay it six times, some of them pay it seven, eight, depending on how many years whiskey stays in the barrel. And I got it from every single one of these startups that I talked to that chose not to locate in Kentucky. That was a major factor. Bus the other one was business climate. They look at the local taxes imposed on retail sales. In California, uh, wine is a signature industry. Therefore, you would expect California wine to be treated favorably. And it is. It's the lowest taxed in the country. Those markets that, that uh, claim beer is a signature industry Colorado, Missouri, and uh, Wisconsin, uh, their beer taxes are in the lower 20%. Kentucky is only three states in the country have a higher tax on bourbon than we do here in Kentucky, and it's and that's at retail. But that in that has that has popped up a lot. So, in conclusion, I would say that the internationalization of bourbon is well on its way. Kentucky will benefit, but. Uh, 
uh, I think it's going to take some forward thinking in order to own it like we own it today. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sure there'll be some questions and we may want to go in deeper e even into exports, okay? Uh, Nick Nicholson, the horse industry. You want to come here? Nope. You nope. can stay right there. I'll okay. just get up. Well, just because I'm sitting on this doesn't mean I'm old. Oh, Make that abundantly clear. Technology. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, she's great. If, if anybody in this room has not met her or spent time with her, before you leave this thing, get to know her. Uh, she, she, when she was governor, she had one speech. She gave it over and over and over again. We've got to change our economy. We've got to do economic development. We have to have jobs for our kids and grandkids, and we're only going to be able to do that with education. So here we are, 19 years later, and we're talking about the same thing, and she said it, and she also... Uh, uh, I wasn't going to say any of this, but she, she also went to Japan at a time where everyone, every single person, every, every single economic expert in the country said uh, a woman chief executive should not go to Japan, take a group. She went and she said, I can sell Kentucky. And uh, all of us have benefited dramatically because she had the guts to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thought you might know less about mine. Uh, Dave Atkinson, our dear friend of all three of us, called and said, we're looking for somebody to speak after Pierce Lyons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He said, let me rephrase it. So we're looking for somebody that cares enough about Kentucky that would be willing to do in the message in spite of speaking after Pierce Lyons. And so that's why Joe and Bill and I were up here. I, I, I've known and liked these two guys for a long, long time, and, and uh, they're great. Uh, I thought you might not know as much about the thoroughbred industry, so uh, as it relates to exports, uh, he confidently hits the button. You should have practiced. There it is. There we go. <laughs> he hit the auto thing on now. Uh, we are probably known more, at least for the people in this room, as a racetrack. That's our more visible thing. Uh, our racing program is doing very, very well. We just finished a record race meet in April and most of the records that it beat were from last October. So uh, uh, it's not to say, like Bill, our industry has issues and we have problems that we have to work our way through, no question about that, but at our core, I deeply believe that we are an industry and a Kentucky industry worth fighting for. People like it, Two, 270,000 people came to the races uh, this past October and I can tell you, uh, they helped Bill's industry and they <laughs> had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, the market share that Keeneland has, we, we, we gauge our market share by how we're doing nationally. We're trying to compete against New York. We're trying to compete against Los Angeles and, and little old Lexington. And 13 out of the 15 days that we raced in April, we were the number one in the market share by the way that we keep score on, on handle, uh, which is amount wagered on the size of our, uh, of our fields, of, of horses, and on attendance. Uh, uh, so it's pretty good. As it relates to exports, which is the topic here, the more relevant aspect of Keeneland's business is that of a sales company. We sell thoroughbreds at public auction. Uh, we have, to give you an idea, the market share of North America. Uh, we have 65% of the total uh, 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 number of horses sold uh, in North America sell at Keeneland. 81% of the broodmare market, 69% of the yearling market, 92% of the weanling market. We're not too much in the two-year-old market. That's mostly Florida and some other places. But you get an idea that with that kind of market share, we have international uh, recognition of a brand. We, we felt like about 10 years ago, we had a brand that we could build on and take the message internationally. Uh, and that's what we tried to do. Uh, oh, I forgot about this slide. Uh, this was in a presentation I did last week. It's sort of a Keeneland commercial, and, and uh, I left it in. 11 of the, uh, this year's Derby, this is pretty typical. 11 of the 20 horses in this year's Derby field uh, came from the Keeneland sales. For the, those of you whose life's not going to be complete until you have a derby winner, this is a, the hint of where to go to get one. <laughs> you want a starter. Uh, half of the last 10 years, half of the Triple Crown races were won by horses 
that came out of the Keeneland sales. And uh, since January 1st of this year, through the weekend, uh, we, uh, Keeneland sales graduates have won half, more than half of the graded stakes in North America. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very deeply embedded uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in, in our industry. We won 75 Breeders' Cup races and we won six last year. Fairly typical of the performance. To give you an idea of the export market and the size of our business, since uh, I went back uh, 30 years, figured we could do some, some trends. Since 1982, we have sold um, $14 billion worth of thoroughbreds in Lexington, Kentucky. It's the only place we sell. And about three and a half billion of those, just tacked under 10%, have gone to various places around the world. And what we decided about 10 years ago is that we could take a gamble that if we went around the world and we got people to come to Lexington to buy horses, we didn't want to do it on the internet, we didn't want to do it uh, by phone, we didn't want to take Keeneland and put it on the road, that was one of our options. A lot of people said that's what we should do because we have such a good brand name. But we felt that if we could get them to come to Kentucky, they would like the people, they would be treated honestly and honorably, and they would begin to develop business relationships other than just coming to Keeneland to buy a horse. We knew they trusted us already because of the reputation, but we could parlay that trust and honesty into relationships of selling them uh, transportation services. Uh, one of the good things about selling somebody internationally a horse is that no one's gonna ride it back to their country anymore. <laughs> so they're, they're gonna have to uh, uh, use a Kentucky transportation company and a Kentucky insurance company and a uh, uh, Kentucky pedigree, Kentucky veterinarians. So all these relationships have been formed uh, because of the thing that's unique to our business is that the only way you can buy from Kenya is to come to Lexington. I thought you might want to see our market share of how we're doing with countries around the world. If you took the Kentucky foe crop and we were a country, we'd be the third largest in the world. Uh, 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 Australia is bigger than we are, and we, we do a few more than, than Ireland does. If you see in 1991, we had 19% market share of the North American foal crop, and this year we've got 33%. So our market share has increased. At the same time, our, our racing numbers uh, at the high end, the Derby and the Keeneland meet and things like that, are doing better than ever. So it's, it's not unlike Bill's message in that quality branded with Kentucky sales. Uh, we, this is, this is a, a, an example where we have, th th this is not an example, this is the map of where we have sold horses uh, in the last two, three years from people uh, all over. You see, uh, uh, absent China, we're doing very well. Uh, and we, we have a plan there. We, have, we did this, we started 10 years ago, and we actually went to the other countries. We went to many places. You'd be amazed at some of the questions we got about Kentucky. You know, do you have roads? Do you have hotels? Are there places we can stay there? Uh, uh, can we rent a car there? Where do we do, where do we? And uh, so to come from there to the, now they're coming back over and over again. They're buying a little bit more every year, every year, every year. We, uh, and, um, uh, we have in the green there, everywhere there's green in that country, we have won their top races. Uh, we, we swept a one, two, three, the Moscow Derby three years ago, and the next year we were just inundated with Russians wanting to beat the other guy that won the, the <laughs> Moscow Derby the year before. And that's kind of the way it works. So uh, that gives you an idea of what we're trying to do, an idea of the, of the size of it. Uh, they're bigger industries, but for for our size, we're, we think we're pretty relevant. And, um, uh, and also, the key element, and I think this is why this is important for businesses, is that we're trying to get the, we're, we're demanding that these people come to Kentucky to experience Kentucky overall and to <coughs> utilize other Kentucky businesses while they're buying thoroughbreds. So it's a good, it's a good partnership and uh, it'll be very relevant. Thank you. <laughs>